movie, The Smashing Bird I Used to Know, rounds up Friday night's entertainment here on Central. If you've been wondering whether you could try making a child's birthday cake, then I hope today you'll learn something to help, because my guest is quite an expert, Mrs. Pauline Sykes of Rockcliffe near Goul in North Humberside. Welcome, Pauline. Hello, Grace. How did you become interested in cake decorating? Well, about eight years ago, I worked with a lady that was quite good at cake decorating, and she more or less fired my imagination. And I carried on and went to Evening Institute, and then I've just finished a three-year City and Guild course. Have you indeed? Mm -hmm. I know you got a distinction, one of yes, your exams. Yes, I did. Well yeah. done. Yes, I was quite pleased. Mm. I expect you'd say this is quite a simple cake, wouldn't you? It is really, yes. Well, what are the points that you would say to somebody who's a, a would-be cake decorator that are really important? I always start off with a good foundation, a good, firm, fairly flat cake. Uh -huh. um, try and get your icing as smooth as possible and a steady hand for the piping. Mm, a bit of practice, probably. That's right, yes, and confidence in handling it as yeah. well. These are charming, aren't they? Yes, they are. Super for a party. Yes. Well, I'll let you get started. OK, thank you. The cake Pauline has made is actually from our recipe for a 456 sponge. And here is a simpler version made for us by the person who gave me the recipe, an old friend and neighbour of mine, Mrs Gold. And she made this one for you today. Over here is half the quantity, but made with whole wheat flour. And you can get a beautiful, fine whole wheat flour now that makes every bit as good a sponge as an ordinary white flour. That lovely lemon demerara crunch topping as well. And on this raised up plate, madlings. Perhaps you remember them from long ago. They've been going for years and years. Plain sponge rolled in a nice coarse coconut and a raspberry jam underneath and a cherry on the top. And over here, a sponge pudding made with the same mixture and plums underneath. Very nice and simple, easy to do. Now, you saw me bringing this box from the freezer, and if you're sitting there saying, it's a waste of time me making a cake, now there's only me or there's maybe just two of you. But this is what I do. I make the cake, cut it up and freeze it. And they come out of the freezer quite hard and will defrost in a couple of minutes. And they're very nice and fresh. And if you have a microwave, will defrost in about five seconds. Now, if you've ever tasted a homemade Swiss roll like this one, you'll never want to buy a factory-made one again. Now, although you may need to have a pencil and paper handy for some of the tips Pauline has for you, the rest of today's recipes are taken from these books, and nearly all these recipes have been collected and rearranged in this big hardback book. All our books, including this one for the microwave, are in the bookshop, but we'll be giving you more information about the paperbacks at the end of the program. Now, I'm going to start with Mrs. Gold's 456 sponge and the Madelines. Now, the numbers in this recipe, 456, refer to the quantities of ingredients. And you'll notice that instead of a wooden spoon, I'm using a loop-headed whisk. And in the bowl, I've got four ounces of soft margarine and five ounces of sugar. And the loop-headed whisk is Mrs. Gold's tip for a nice, creamy sponge. So I want to beat this until it's got to the fluffy stage where it's white and almost, uh, you know, a lot paler than it was when it started. And once I've got it to that stage, I then add my two large eggs, which I've got beaten up in the bowl. Nearly there. And as well as the eggs at this stage, I want to add the flavouring, which is a vanilla essence or a vanilla flavoured essence. And this particular one's got two little holes at the top so that I can just put it in like that. And I don't have to worry about putting in too much. And in that goes like that. Now I'm ready to put the eggs in. And of course, you don't put them all in at once, just a little at a time. And beat again. And of course, if you've got the machine, you can do it with your machine. 
another bit. And large eggs, I would say, were size one or two. I usually use that when I'm baking. A good big egg makes a big difference to it. And the rest of the egg, in it goes. Now, the flour, you'll notice that I've actually started to sieve it. It's at the side there. And even though it does say super sifted on the bowl, you pay no attention and put it through a sieve again. Now, at this stage, I like to you move over to a spatula. And then I start putting the flour in. And a little at a time, about three tablespoons of flour at a time. Now, that takes quite a little while to do. I'll just show you the movement before I move on to the next bowl where I've got it all done. Now, can you see that? I'm doing it quite lightly. But actually, the bowl sitting over here, I've got all the flour in except for one little bit, and here it is here. And the last tip that Mrs. Gold gives for a light sponge is a big tablespoon of boiling water just to slacken off the mixture and make it really creamy. Now, this mixture, of course, is enough to do two of the tins that you see in front there. And I've already greased that tin with a brush. And I've also got a circle of greaseproof paper to put in to make sure that it comes out perfectly. And half of this mixture will make a sponge about an inch high, an inch and a half. And spread it out with a knife. And it is important to do this carefully. Smooth it around, easing it to the corners. And then standing next door are the little tins I was telling you about. When I was young, they used to be called castle pudding tins. But in fact, they're Dario molds if you're going to buy one. And these have been greased with a brush. But again, very keen on putting little bits of greaseproof paper in the bottom so that they turn out really beautifully. And all I need for one of these is two teaspoons of my mixture. And they go into the oven at the same temperature as the pudding. Remember, we were talking about it earlier on. Here it is here, a nice sponge pudding made from the same mixture. Now, all of these go into a moderately hot oven together at the same temperature, gas 6, 400 Fahrenheit, 200 centigrade and the seven inch cake will take 20 minutes near the top of the oven the madeleines will take only 10 minutes but the pudding needs to go into the lower part of the oven cooler so that it takes 40 minutes to cook so look at it after 20 minutes and see whether or not it's browning too quickly and then you could probably reduce the temperature now i want to just show you the finishing off of the madeleines and a little sponge cake with a lemon icy topping. Now here's my madeleine baked and I'm using a little skewer to get it out because they, uh, you can't put a big knife down there or you'd break it up. And there's the bit of paper that helps it to turn out beautifully and I want to spear this on the bottom of a fork and cover it with my, some of my nice homemade raspberry jam. Nearly always is raspberry uh, I think it's the colour as well, and it's a nice sharp flavour. Not too much jam because you don't want it dripping all over. And then once that's done, it's dunked in a nice coarse coconut. Do look out for that coarse coconut. It's so much nicer than the very fine one that's in a packet. in boxes usually. I buy this at my health food shop and I've got a lot here to dunk it in. You see how much nicer the coarse coconut is. And there it is ready for its final topping which is a little cherry and on each side of it a wee bit of angelica to simulate a bit of greenery. So there it is. Now over here I just want to show you how to do the lemon crunch. Here it is four ounces of sugar in a bowl, two tablespoons of lemon juice, and what I'm aiming at is to do this before the lemon juice has time to melt the sugar. I've still got a crunch here so that the juice soaks into the cake and I end up with a nice crunchy topping. Very much easier to do than icing. Don't tell Pauline though. This is a nice quick one over the top and when that dries off you'll have a crunchy 
sugary topping and a nice lemon flavor which has seeped through into your sponge. There you are, lemon crunch. Now it's time for Pauline to do some of her lovely icing. And this is where you may need a pencil and paper because she's got some really good tips for you. Here I have a cake that I've made with Grace's 456 sponge mixture, one and a half times the quantity, baked at gas number two or 300 Fahrenheit or 150 centigrade. I've baked it for about 20 minutes in a seven to eight inch cake tin. I'm going to trim the edges now so that I, I get the required shape for the clock I'm going to make. These little fancies that you take, these little pieces that you take off, we can leave in our freezer and use as fancies afterwards, or you can use them for trifles. I'm going to use some butter icing to mask the side of this cake, and this is made with four ounces of margarine at room temperature, into which I've added eight ounces of icing sugar, two teaspoons of cocoa that I like to mix with a tablespoon of boiling water. It gives a lovely chocolate consistency. And a couple of drops of vanilla essence, that helps to cut the grease. I'm going to lift the cake up now onto my hand. This you can do if, if you've got that little bit more confidence, but it is easier to use on your hand. I'm going to use the butter icing on the sides of the cake like so. If you make it a bit on the soft side, you will find it a lot easier to, to spread. Another idea about using chocolate buttercream is that it's about the same color as the crumb, so it doesn't matter too much if it does come off. Then I'm going to dip into the chopped nuts here. You can either just dip the cake in, or if you find it easier, or if you've any awkward corners as I have here, you can lift the nuts up to your cake and press them firmly but gently on the sides. If you don't like nuts, if nuts aren't your thing, then there's no reason why you can't use these little coloured hundreds and thousands. A little blob of icing on, on your cake board, and that stops the cake from leaping about in all directions when you're icing it. Make sure it's in the middle. Now then, to do the top of the cake, I'm going to use again the same chocolate buttercream. As you can see, it's a nice soft consistency. And I'm going to spread it across the top. It's quite acceptable when you're using buttercream to leave the mark of the knife in, in the cake. If you get a little bit of, of the edging across, don't worry too much. You can just gently ease it off with your knife a bit later. The edges, of course, we are going to pipe, so it doesn't matter too much if, if your butter icing isn't right to the edge of your cake. There we are. Now then, to do the icing, we want a piping bag. I make mine from half a rectangular sheet of greaseproof paper. Simply hold one corner in your hand, take the other corner and bring it right round your hand, bringing the corner up in front. This you whittle about until you get a nice point on the end. Turn that over two little tears in the top and turn that over, that secures it. Then this end, you want to cut off about three quarters of an inch up because you're going to put a little icing tube in there. Now these icing tubes, I have one here, they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. This one I would call just a medium sized star nozzle. And you pop that inside the bag. Now these bags I make when I'm watching television at night. You have the paper at one side and you can merrily go along making quite a pile of these and as you can see they fit into one another, stand them in a tumbler and you've already got them there when you require them. I'm going to use one to put my piping nozzle in. Just pop it in like that and then you fill your bag with chocolate buttercream. Again, another little tip, only half fill your bag whenever you're piping with anything. Otherwise, the first squirt, it doesn't go on your cake, it goes halfway up your arm. Fold the top over securely. Give it a gentle squeeze. Now I'm going to do some stars across the bottom. This is simply a case of squeezing and releasing. Squeezing and releasing. 
You can do this with any bits of royal icing that you may have left over. Just squeeze it onto waxed paper. And then when they're dry, you've got some lovely decorations for any cakes and fancies that you might like to decorate later on. The top I'm going to do with a shell border. Slightly different in so much as you're squeezing and lifting and pulling. You squeeze, lift and pull. Don't be worried if your borders don't look the same as mine. Piping is very similar to handwriting. The technique's the same, but the actual finished style can look quite different. There you can see I've just done one side. It will take me quite a long time to finish it. I have one here that I've already finished to that stage. Now the clock face we need, and I've done that, I've made that out of some fondant. This fondant I've made with eight marshmallows that you buy in the packets, slightly warmed, and then I've added an ounce and a half of icing sugar, which gives you this lovely soft consistency, which is quite easy to roll out. I have a rolled out piece here I've already cut to the required size, so I'm just going to gently lift that onto the cake. It will stick easily because, of course, the cake's uh, buttercreamed on top. Just give it a little helping hand. Now, onto that, I'm going to put chocolate buttons. Just with a little dab of icing sugar. You can put as many chocolate buttons on as you want, from 1 to 12. I'm just going to put four on, and then it gives you the idea of how we're going to go about things. And then the figures. The 12, the 3, six and 9. The hands of the clock, you can put these on, you know, if your child's 3, then make it 3 o'clock, 5, 5 o'clock. Just a nice, nice little thought. Don't worry if the icing breaks. All that you need is just a little paintbrush and you can ease the two edges together. I always have mine at the side of me there. Now when I've done that, I'm going to do the pendulums. A zigzaggy movement again. You can get quite quick at this once you get that little bit more confidence. couple of chocolate buttons again for the weight. It's coming very handy to do chocolate buttons, don't we? Then I'm just going to pipe some tendrils on here, just to pretty it up. There we go. And then I'm going to change to a smaller star tube, just for the little flowers that just finish it off. Just a little, little flower here and there. If you're not quite confident enough to do the hands as, as I've done them, why not buy a roll of the uh, gift wrap ribbon that you can buy in all the shops. Just cut two out and then you can just stick them on the cake face and it saves you from piping. And there we are with a nice Hickory Dickory Dock clock. Do you remember the offcuts from the fondant? I've made them into a little mouse here, and I'm just going to pop that mouse on the edge of the board with his little tail going up the cake. You can incidentally freeze this cake. I wouldn't keep it for any longer than two months, though, but it freezes perfectly well. In actual fact, I forgot to tell you that I do like to work on a half-frozen cake. I normally get them out of the freezer about an hour and a half before I want to work on them and it's a nice firm surface. That's delightful, Polly, really lovely. I do admire these little squiggly bits at the bottom. <laughs> Perhaps we've got time to say just how you made your little mice men. Yes, well again, they're made with a four, five, six mixture, baked in the little paper cups, and then I stick a round marshmallow on the top of each one of them, just with mm -hmm. a little dab of chocolate, coat them in chocolate, and when they're almost dry, just two slits for their ears, which of course are chocolate buttons. Uh -huh. And I pipe on the eyes and the nose with buttercream. Oh, they look very sweet. Thank Bonnet. you very much. Thank you. <laughs>
Now, I'm going to make the Swiss roll. I've already got one in the oven so that you'll be able to see how to roll them up. In the bowl here, I've already whisked to the perfect consistency two large eggs and two and a half ounces of vanilla sugar. Now, I want to add two and a half ounces of plain white flour through a sieve so that I get a nice fine coating of flour across the surface of my beautifully whisked eggs. Off it goes. And I like to fold the flour in with a, a rubber spatula, a nice bendy one. Some people do it with a large uh, metal spoon, but I find this one much the best one. Fold it round but using a figure of eight movement, very gently digging down so there's no dry flour at the bottom. Now, if you're wondering what vanilla sugar is, have a look at that jar there. It's just ordinary caster sugar with a real vanilla pod in it. And that va vanilla pod will give you the perfect flavor of vanilla. But of course, if you don't have that vanilla pod, just a few drops of vanilla essence would work perfectly well. And lastly, a dessert spoon of hot water, just to give that final creamy texture to this Swiss roll. Fold it again, very lightly, no point in knocking out all that air that was taken at least three, three and a half minutes to beat in earlier on. There it is, ready for going into the tin now. And the Swiss roll tin I've already greased and lined with uh, greaseproof paper to make sure it comes out really well. So pour it in gently. Scrape it all out. And you can see how soft it is and fluffy. That's the exact texture it should be. Now use a knife, gently ease it into the corners. And this Swiss roll goes into a, a moderately hot oven. Gas mark six, 400 degrees Fahrenheit, 200 degrees centigrade for about 15 to 20 minutes. And in fact, Pauline should be getting me out of the oven, one that I put in 20 minutes ago. That's it, Pauline. Thank you very much. Now, here it is, beautifully done. And a good tip of your checking to see if it is fully cooked and see if it's starting to shrink away from the sides of the tin. Now, take the knife, and you've gone off on my cloth, Pauline. <laughs> take the knife and loosen it all the way around, just to release it a bit, because it's got the paper underneath, so it'll pro it doesn't need to be loosened at the bottom. If you have a look here, you'll see that I've got a tea towel lying on the, on the surface of the workbench, and I've actually wrung it out water. It's a bit damp. And on top of it is a piece of uh, greaseproof paper, which is dredged with sugar. Now, we'll get this turned out, I hope, onto the sugary surface. Needing a little helping hand. That's it now. Down it goes. And of course, the paper has to be peeled off now. And I can move away the weights that were holding the paper down. Peel it off. And because the edges of down the long edge of the Swiss roll nearly always is a little bit crusty, I'm going to trim off just a quarter of an inch down each long edge. There we are. And this is to help it to roll nicely. Here we are, and another little nick across the bottom, again to help it to roll. And the jam, my own lovely fresh jam from my own raspberries. You can see how lovely and bright it is. Very much nicer than a bought one. And spread it out to the corners. Not right out, because you don't want to squeeze it out. And it's ready to roll up now. And using the paper to help you to do it, turn it over, and it should fold at that first nick. Turn it over again. Give it a little squeeze, and there you have a perfect Swiss roll. It has to cool down, of course, to eat it. You don't want to eat it while it's, while it's hot. And doesn't that look beautiful? 
I hope you're going to enjoy trying that. Next time, my guest is a fellow Scot. Her name is Yvonne Cool, and she works for the Seafish Authority in Edinburgh. So be prepared for a very fishy programme. In the meantime, Polly and I must say goodbye. It's been lovely having you, Pauline. Thank you very much. Thank Going you to for say goodbye? Me. Goodbye. Cheerio. Farmhouse Kitchen Books 1, 2 and 3 are still available at £2.55 each, including postage and packing. And our new microwave cookbook is now available, priced £2.95, including postage and packing. All of these books are available from bookshops and newsagents, or can be obtained by sending a cheque or postal order to Farmhouse Kitchen, Admail 35, Leeds, LS3, 1XY.